Welcome to Resilient. I'm Don Fancher, the global leader for Deloitte's forensic practice, as well as the co-leader of our legal business services practice and the co-host of our chief legal officer track. You know, with all the uncertainty of today's environment, it's truly blurring the boundaries of today's legal department. The legal office has shifted to no longer being just about protecting the organization from risk, but also now being called upon to transform operations and grow the business. It's driving innovative thinking, new approaches, and a rapid adoption to the greater use of technology. Today, we're going to talk about what that looks like for an innovative technology company with an equally innovative legal leader. I'm joined by Rishi Varma, General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Hewlett Packard Enterprises. Let's hear what he has to say about embracing innovation, creating value, and what it means to be a resilient leader. Hey, Rishi, so glad to have you with us today. Thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Don. Thanks for having me. So where are you today? Our offices have been closed uh, since March, and so have been sitting here in the home office and uh, you know, competing for bandwidth every now and then with my three <laughs> high school kids and my wife. But uh, I have I have such low priority at home that uh, it's sort of the inverse of when I travel. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, hopefully the, they're uh, they're focusing on their schoolwork to take up that bandwidth and not video games <laughs> and the like. But if it's anything like my own personal experience, it's uh, usually some combination of the two. Right. <laughs> Well, again, thanks so much for being with us today. I'd like to take just a few minutes and talk about your background. First question out of the gate, did you always want to be a lawyer? Oh, God, no. Um, in fact, I grew up in a family of physicians. So both my parents and now my, and my older sister is also a physician. So I naturally thought I would follow in their footsteps. Um, that is until I actually saw blood for the first time. So uh, once, once I came to from having passed out, I started thinking about other career opportunities. But, um, you know, what, what did draw me to the law, I think, was gradually thinking about a strength of negotiation and the ability to protect and defend against challenges with your arguments and with your persuasion. And, and I tended to be pretty good at that um, from an early age. And so thinking about repurposing my idea of bedside manner into a legal skill set was something that I started getting excited about, um, probably just sort of to the tail end of college, and then obviously went into law school for that purpose. But no, it was not something that I grew up thinking I'd want to do at the beginning. So a quick side question, when when you decided you were not going to go into the, into the medical field, did you have that conversation with your parents? And uh, if so, how did they react? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, so son of immigrants, parents who came to this country in the late 60s, and then my sister and I were born here. And I think they naturally had this view of what their life would be like with their families and with their children based on their upbringings in India. And so I think they just naturally thought, you know, we're doctors, we've done that, we've worked hard to get there, our children will also be doctors, because that's a very stable profession, etc. So I was, I was actually quite nervous about having the conversation with them around my own career. Now, let's let's not kid ourselves. I, I'm not exactly going into a risk-averse profession. Um, you know, I wasn't telling them that I was going to go follow my dream in Hollywood and, and try and be an actor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, the conversation that I thought would be very challenging was one that they thought was very welcoming. They said, you know, um, we didn't come here so that you would follow in our footsteps. We came in here, we came to this country so that you would make your own. And if you if you want to do something with the law, if you want to practice, and you know that's not something that we have seen out of our family, and we'd love for you to be the first one of our of our family to do that. And so uh, there was it was a nice moment of just genuine support and that kind of unconditional uh, support that you you come to learn more and more as a parent than you did as a child. But um, you know it, it was a nice moment and certainly helped helped me feel like I was both supported and encouraged to join the profession. That's fantastic. And, and, you know, that kind of support really then begins to catapult you along the way. And I think uh, I would expect you might agree. It also helps form you as a leader. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to get in a few minutes to talk a little bit about 
you know, some of the specifics on your career and, and the journey that you've followed to get where you are today. But before we even go there, starting a little bit at a bigger picture than that, memorable moments, things in your sure. career that stand out to you. Yeah. And, and there, you know, as I, as I think about that, there are probably three things that come to mind and they're not, none of them are specific client work or a transaction that I worked on. I mean, I've, I've had the luxury and, and real privilege to work on some really transformative deals and transformative issues, not just for HPE, but for other companies. But the first lesson that really stuck with me was never asking someone to do something you don't already know how to do. And, and as a first year associate in New York, I sort of blindly followed my peers as we tasked paralegals with assignments during a transaction. And when something didn't go well, and I honestly had no idea why, I, I think I learned that lesson the hard way. You know, you, you, you need to know in order to be a leader, in order to be part of a team, you need to understand what you are asking other people to do so that you can understand what happens if that doesn't happen. And, and so that, that lesson is stick, stuck with me today. You know, even if I'm asking a subject matter expert that I don't know anything about, I have a sense of what I expect the outcome to be or what I'm thinking about so that as we have that dialogue or as I rely on that person, I think more about what I'm expecting out of it. And I think more about the things that I'm asking other people to do. Uh, another lesson learned later in my career was really more about the balance that I find is so necessary and something that has ha you know, really helped me and my leadership during the pandemic. But um, when I was a junior associate in New York and every day I'd step out of my apartment, I would walk towards the subway and there was a huge building across the street and there was a banner on it that said, remember, the people you work for are at home. And, and left to my own devices, I would probably simply work nonstop. But uh, my wife early on forced me to balance my career with my family when the kids were born. And I was home every night for dinner except when traveling. Um, and to this day, it's where we spend the most time together, whether it's arguing or discussing or laughing or sharing news about our lives. So I hope they take that lesson with them as they start their careers one day, because I will never forget. I will never regret not staying late at the office on a Tuesday night, but I would always regret missing bedtime and bath time when they were little and then just generally fostering that conversation with them. And, and lastly, um, you know, I remember that feeling of joining Hewlett Packard, which is just this behemoth tech company uh, eight years ago. And to me, it was the legal department was on a different scale than I had ever experienced. And, um, you know, I learned more about leadership and changing the game here than I would have ever learned elsewhere, just given the opportunity. So to me, those were the most memorable moments in my career. That's amazing and great perspective. And I love the fact uh, that your wife actually forced that on you a little bit and, yeah. and then you capitulated. That makes a huge difference. And uh, right. again, uh, a great testament and a, a very important for, for all of us to keep in mind. I, I have to say, um, not to make this a COVID conversation by any stretch, although we'll touch on it, obviously, but uh, has that changed or been impacted the, in, in the last eight months or so since your offices have been closed? We have certainly had far more time together to um, both enjoy each other's company, get tired of each other's company. But, uh, you know, as my kids are older now, I think back to those foundational moments around the dinner table where we learned to engage with one another as people and as people with thoughts and ideas rather than as, you know, you are the child, we are the parents and, and don't talk until spoken to. And it's that kind of foundation that has led to, I mean, we've had three hour discussions at the dinner table, particularly during the summer about a lot of social justice issues and not always seeing things the same way. Um, you know, when you're 16 years old and the world is ahead of you and you, you see these issues versus when you're a parent with three children, a house and a mortgage and, and a career and you see things differently, but just being able to have those conversations, whether we agree, whether we disagree, but being able to do that, we've certainly had more time together than we would have if not for the pandemic. But the pandemic has also created more of those tense conversations as well. No doubt about it. And uh, uh, something we can all take away from that. Yeah. So let's get a little more, more specific. 
sure. you've had a you've had a very interesting professional background. You've been involved in different industries. You've done different things: private practice, uh, corporate legal departments. Talk a little bit about the journey and uh, and the steps along the way that got you to where you are now as the CLO and general counsel for sure. HPE. Sure. So um, started as an associate in a New York firm, and um, you know my view at the time was I wanted to better understand corporate transactional practice, and so being in New York, I thought would be the the epicenter of a lot of transactional activity. Um, I, I quickly moved to a firm that was just starting its New York office. It's a firm, Brobeck, Flager, and Harrison, which is no longer uh, around, but in its heyday, particularly in the late 90s, this was a California-based firm that had a very different model than most firms around them. And that model was really focused on the customer experience and the client. And most of my time spent at Brobeck was um, sitting at the you know new offices of my client that had you know rented an office and had 25 million dollars in seed money but had no idea how to start a company they had an idea people invested in it but they didn't know what else to do and so it was that point that i started thinking about being part of a company because most of my time was spent you know figuring out how to set up stock options how to rent office space? Uh, what does it look like to hire employees? What is the board going to look like? And what are they going to focus on early stage, et cetera? And, and the more and more I did that, the less and less tied to a firm, I, I felt, but I was more tied to the success and, and you know, the pitfalls or challenges that any of my clients faced. But it also felt even harder when you would move on to the next client or move on to the next transaction because you felt like you weren't always ready to let go or you wanted to finish, you wanted to see how it turned out once they went public. Uh, What was the next step in that journey? And as outside counsel, you didn't always get a chance to have those conversations or experiences because, frankly, the company would call you when they needed you. And right now they needed to focus on internal growth and and mindset and culture, et cetera. So as we, um, as my wife and I were uh, thinking about next steps, uh, we we unfortunately, you know, experienced September 11th in New York City. And that really escalated our thinking around what is what is it going to look like when we grow up? What is our next step in our careers? And we both are from Texas and we decided we wanted to come home. And um, that was also an opportunity for me to think about what kind of engagement did I want out of my career? And that was my first opportunity to either go back to a firm or to go to an in-house uh, department. And I chose the latter. I went to an in-house co- uh, department. And really, it was the first time I got to see the potential for impact. Um, but it's certainly harder to carve out a way to make that happen, particularly with a smaller legal department. The you know So I'd say for the next 10 years or so, uh, worked through various public companies in Houston and um, moved along the you know, along that sort of corporate ladder from general counsel to chief administrative officer and in, in one company becoming the president of their subsea services division, um, all along the way, kind of never, never leaving the legal mindset behind. But uh, when HP called in late 2012, it to me represented an opportunity to do all of the things I wanted to do with a legal department, but at scale. Um, I wanted to be able to really work closely with the board as they thought about corporate governance and best practices there. I wanted to work on on leading edge disclosures and shareholder engagement and um, the the kind of large scale M&A that uh, you read about in the papers. I wanted to be part of that process and learning how to make make, the best and most innovative ways to make that happen. And so um, ultimately coming to HP in early 2013, was sort of, to me, the, the culmination of a long road of doing things in different companies that gave me touch points of things that I really enjoyed. But putting it all together, I got a chance at HP to sort of manage my own department on a large scale and then ultimately became the general counsel once we did our separation um, in uh, 2017. It's fantastic. And I know you also serve, if I'm correct, as the CEO of a couple of subsidiaries of HPE. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah. So we talk have- a little bit about that. Talk about the distinctions between when you're playing the role of a CLO and you're, and even when you were a chief administrative officer prior to it and now your role as a CEO, where are the similarities and where are the distinctions in that? Well, I think similarities in terms of how you think about the um, ultimate outcomes that you, you want out of the, the performance of the company, the performance of the subsidiary, or ultimately the performance of the legal department. Um, but they're all so closely connected to the business. And to me, it it really hones the skills of a lawyer to better understand the business. And so as a lawyer, I'm always preaching, you know, the business is the North Star. And it's not enough to just support the business in executing contracts or negotiating commercial transactions, but it's better understanding, you know, what's the outcome of that transaction? Why is that significant? What does it mean to to secure that five-year deal with the U.S. federal government? And, and what are we going to do um, you know, if we don't succeed here. So um, I think it gives you a much better sense of the appetite for risk, but the opportunities and the rewards for risk mitigation when you can see both sides of that coin. And you're not just looking at, you know, the worst thing you can do as a lawyer, in my opinion, is provide advice that suggests this is the, you know, these are the legal issues, but there are other business issues that somebody else is going to have to opine on. Um, what I what I want and what I stress with my team is look holistically at the opportunity ahead, provide the you know lens through which you see risk from a legal perspective, but don't stop at the don't stop from a business perspective. Know the business, know the underlying premise and rationale for the deal, know why it's important to the company, and use that to shape your decision making accordingly. So to me, it's sort of two sides of the same coin, but if you can look at it from both sides, you will ultimately be the best either business person or the best legal person or the best functional support um, possible for the company. And, you know, we're, I want us to kind of transition into talking about transformation, what legal departments are facing today, but as a segue into that and kind of building off of what you just talked about, are you seeing that opportunity to take legal professionals and elevate them into business-oriented roles, something that is perhaps becoming more readily available to lawyers? Are board seeing that opportunity? Is management seeing that? Uh, is there a shift now, or is that something that you think uh, has always been there, just not maybe not discussed as much as, as I seem to be hearing it today? I think it's, pr- I mean, I think certain things have elevated the visibility of lawyers and legal professionals more so than in years past. But I think increasingly, and maybe for the last five to 10 years, really good lawyers have understood exactly what we just talked about, which is you you are not just providing legal advice, you are providing advice through through a legal lens. Um, So you're understanding what risks and opportunities lie ahead, but you're you're also understanding the, the business rationale for either doing a deal or negotiating or a commercial agreement, et cetera. But if you think to, you know, think so many things have hit corporate America recently, whether it was intense cybersecurity issues, data privacy, the pandemic that has, you know, called into question um, the ability to, you know, should we require temperature checks? What sort of safety protocols should we have? And in so many of those instances, what you have thought of as part of your work streams have been, well, what are our risks? You know, what, what, it, where are we protected? Where are we not? Do we have to disclose something? Do we not? And so along the way, I think lawyers have had a bigger voice in advising boards, advising management teams on the risks and opportunities ahead. And I think as a result of that, more and more people are seeing that lawyers, good lawyers, can actually be good business advisors as well. And so it's probably been a, con- a convergence of you know, heightened crises over the last three or four years, coupled with a keen sense of awareness and visibility to how lawyers uh, proceed in each of those crises. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I, I certainly see it more and more now. And uh, all of the issues that you just addressed, the pandemic certainly seems to have accelerated that process. Likewise, it seems to have accelerated this issue of transformation. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, when you say transformation, at least in the circles that I run in, they tend to think technology. And that's a big key. And I want to talk technology in a moment. But 
Before we get into anything specific, I'd actually just love to hear your thoughts on what transformation, especially in the legal department, means for you. Sure. You know, for me, um, uh, we have this mantra in our group about fail fast to learn and improve. Um, because I don't think people talk enough about failure as much as they want to celebrate success. But to me, transformation assumes that there will be failure. You cannot transform without taking some missteps first, because you have to have that growth mindset and always be evolving around how you think about whether it is, you know, what the department looks like, how we service the client, how can we increase efficiencies in our own ability to do so, uh, what does our talent look like. Um, so to me, it's transformation is really about having that growth mindset and always evolving, having the ability to think about failing fast, but learning and improving from that. But if you think about your organization as having that framework, um, you you will find that people are willing to take steps sooner than later. They're not waiting for, well, let's wait until this is completely safe to do so because I don't want to be the first one to offer this new idea or this new way of thinking. I want to just wait until somebody else tells me to do it. So um, you have to have that growth mindset and that willingness to fail in order to transform. So. When you think transformation, um, you know one of the, one of the phrases you hear a lot of is people. You hear process, and you hear technology. Mm -hmm. Of those three, is does anyone resonate more with you or less, or what is your thinking about the uh, the applicability of those three areas? And what, admittedly, is probably a bit of an overused term, but I think it's still applicable. Yeah, look, I think um, I don't think anything will replace. This is going to sound weird, but I don't think anything replaces top talent um, because even your best talent can can generate uh, ideas or improvements through innovation through technology but when you have an organization that has kind of a continuous flow of talent up and down the organization I think you end up getting that high potential high performing organization and that is the you know with that transformative mindset that growth mindset you end up getting people that will do far more for your organization uh, than if you sort of stay the course with, you know, the challenge particularly in-house is people don't necessarily want to make changes in their talent unless forced to do so. And the, you know, one of the things we think about is I, I very much want our organization to look like a talent factory where we bring people in we promote, we develop, we, you know, they're mobile throughout the organization. But at a certain point, if there's a blocker in your path, I don't, I don't want you to simply sit here because, you know, it's good for me. I want to make sure that we're constantly looking at ways to utilize talent. And, and frankly, if, if that doesn't help propel your organization forward, then you likely have some blockers along the way. But I'm far more valuable to this organization if I develop talent than I am just my individual um, expertise. But so to me, it, to me, it's it's really starts with with your view of talent and your view of how you develop your top talent. But then I think most definitely, and and you know, we are a tech company, so we end up having a little bit of a tech focus in our legal department. Um, when you look at data across multiple organizations. I mean, data is the new currency. And we all utilize it so regularly and often, we tend to think of legal services as more of an art than a science. But, you know, providing guidance can be more of an art. Um, but how you manage your resources, how you develop your talent doesn't have to be done in a vacuum. And so we definitely leverage technology and leverage data to better understand how our teams use their time and where we can invest more in, in our top talent. As a CLO, how has technology, whether it be historically over time and certainly the technology we're seeing today, how has that influenced you and influenced the way that you run your legal department? Um, you know, I think it really stems from the ability to use analytics to, to both protect your existing level of resources, but also make you more efficient with your resources. So one example of that. Um, we've used time recording data over the last five, six years to better understand how our team uses its time. So where do they spend more of their time? And are those the right areas? 
and, and we look at it across each spectrum. So for example, if I'm in one group and I have managers and I have individual contributors, I think of them differently as I expect them to spend their time. I'm not talking about how many hours they work. I'm talking about the percentage of time they spend in different areas. So if my manager is not spending enough time managing that team, that's a concern. If Similarly, if my individual contributor is not spending a significant majority of her time on you know, the core commercial contracts of that department, that's a concern. So using data like that helps us understand the capacity within our system, but it also helps us understand where we can make more impact from our high potential performers. So I don't want an organization that everybody sits there and reviews non-disclosure agreements every day, because that's kind of the lowest of low end agreements that our legal team can review. And any time that takes my team is time taken away from highly customizable, more complex transactions. So if we can create um, an annotated NDA, or if we can create specific metrics and measures that we look for in those non-disclosure agreements that uh, an outsourced uh, offshore center can look at and can provide us with their review. You know, more routine matters, more, more matters that are predictable, we can get um, time spent elsewhere through data analytics so that we have a better way of investing in our talent to do other more impactful things. You get better talent retention, you get better output from your talent, um, but it's also, you know, it's, you have to be willing to use technology in that way. And I think it, it can be overwhelming for a lot of legal teams to think about all of the different things. And you've heard everything from AI to, you know, automated processes and the like. And it's hard to simply just say, let's go ahead and put those into our system. You have to think about what am I going to get out of this? Um, because I'm going to invest time, I'm going to invest resources, and if it fails, then I'm probably going to take two steps backwards the next time I try to leverage any sort of technology. So, you know, we have to be very careful when we implement new tools. We like to pilot them through a smaller group, get some focus group type of pushback, tell us what worked, what didn't work, and then, um, you know, leverage their thinking into whether or not this is something that we should move forward with. And that's one of the things that I see so often is technology is actually very available to lawyers in legal departments, Mm -hmm. but there can be a hesitancy to use it. So how do you overcome that or what specific things have you done personally to help your legal teams grow their skills when it comes to technology? Yeah. So some of it is um, making it accessible. Uh, Sometimes people don't know that it can be easy until somebody shows them. And, and I'll use an example of um, virtual reality. So pre-pandemic, there were several of us in my group that were thinking about the challenge every year we have of trying to see everybody in our department. You know, we're 300 plus legal professionals worldwide, and budgets don't always allow everybody to see everyone. You know, whether they're face-to-face meetings, all-hand meetings, etc. So how we were thinking, you know, how can we move? How can we see each other? How can we be more accessible with each other? How can we connect more absent the ability to take time to fly to Singapore or to Japan or et cetera? And so we started playing with virtual reality. We invested in headsets for about eight of us, and we created different forums in virtual reality where we could, you know, our avatars could meet. And um, it, it started taking, taking shape, but we also realized that it was not that hard. And so we invited more people. And so gradually over the year, over this pandemic year, we upped it to about 45 of our legal uh, professionals have virtual reality headsets. And just this morning, I participated in our virtual reality holiday party. And there were about 30 of us there and we were having snowball fights and uh, just talking and, and, you know, shaking hands with one another in VR and doing all of those things that you can't do right now in a socially distant manner. But But I think back to that 14 months ago when we started this idea, if I had simply told people in the legal department, this is going to happen, I wouldn't have gotten any traction because most people would think it's either not relevant or it's not practical or it's not easy to do. So you have to gradually feed into, is this something we can work with? 
And then once you get that momentum, right now I've got more people, you know, clamoring to join us in virtual reality because of the pandemic and because of the ability to see more people and connect more people. So you have to you have to be willing to accept a lot of setbacks, but also willing to accept a little bit of a slower trajectory, even when you can see how immediately this might work for the department. You're giving uh, the webcasting uh, thing we're all learning and dealing with now in the pandemic a whole new meaning. Yeah. <laughs> that would be fun to participate in. Um, I've also heard that you've actually encouraged some of your lawyers to learn to code. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, if I think back to when I started as a corporate attorney, um, you know, one of the things that we lawyers thought would be, you know, the closest thing to being a business attorney was better understanding the financials. And lawyers are increasingly well-versed in financials around a business. You know, they can read the financial statements, the balance sheets, the pro forma balance sheets. They can read the MD&A in a, in a Form 10K, et cetera. But as a tech company, I thought, you know, knowing the business likely means better understanding the underlying code. And so wouldn't it be cool if we had lawyers that could code? So two years ago, we launched a pilot program. We had eight attorneys that started this, you know, joined this program. And it was a six month program where they learned uh, a language and they were able to kind of think about and, and practice and, and, you know, take tests. And it was all done um, online. And they, you know, three things happened along the way that sort of validated the, pr the premise that I had. Number one, they became infinitely better in understanding the risks this business faces. When they were, um, you know, when they were reviewing due diligence of either a target M&A company or re reviewing the key commercial negotiations for a customer contract, they had a better understanding of the underlying technology and they could ask better questions. Similarly, they could understand the answers to those questions and they could process those through a lens with which to say, I think this is doable or I think this is a risk we can manage. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a great consequence. Unintended consequence was they became better drafters. If you think about the precision involved in coding, they started to review provisions in commercial agreements in particular along the same way. And, you know, if you don't understand what the provision says, as, as somebody who codes in a different language, it just doesn't make sense. You won't get the output. And so they started finding ways to make sure that they could, you know, if you looked at some of these draft agreements, they would negotiate, they would put in the margins what's the output of this paragraph? What's the output of this paragraph? And those kinds of things make such a big difference when you're looking at long-term customer service agreements with milestones that trigger revenue generation or margin protection along the way. And so they, they really started to think more precisely about, I, I need to make sure I understand what this says. Tell me what the output of this is supposed to be. And then the third uh, unintended consequence was they started thinking about ways to code different things that we do today in our legal department. One of which is, you know, from a corporate perspective, every quarter we have a uh, insider trading window. Is our window open or closed? And there are various people that are subject to those trading restrictions based on their position in the company. Historically, that was a spreadsheet exercise. And somebody in the corporate department had this master spreadsheet that was updated every quarter. And if somebody said, hey, am I on that list? They would email them, they would call them, they would look at the names and they would say, yes, you're on this list. No, you're not on this list. Well, two of the people that were taking that first coding program, one of them handled that specifically. And he thought to himself, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And so he created a code where if I punched in my employee number into this database, it would tell me whether or not I'm on a trading restriction. And if so, which one am I on? And then it would spit me into the information section on our insider trading policy and who to contact with questions, et cetera. So instantly that's innovation because he has now freed himself up from having to do that arcane exercise of reviewing a spreadsheet. But at the same time, it's sped up how an employee is able to understand their place in that. And he can now do other things with his time rather than just wait every quarter to see if somebody has a question there. So, you know, it, 
it is, you know, we've now, this is the second year into it. We have 10 more uh, attorneys that are learning how to code and each of them have created sort of an ongoing coding community. And, you know, I don't know where we'll end up with it, but I can tell you right now that it's already paying off. I love unintended consequences when they're positive like that. And I can absolutely see the benefit, you know, and it makes me think about something Rishi and, and, and actually a conversation that I've had with others when you think about lawyers and how they're trained and how they go through law school and the things that lawyers focus on, do you believe law schools specifically will begin to make a shift similar to what you've just described and, and put technology more on the agenda for coursework or experiences? You know, it's a great question. I don't know if they will go all the way there, but I have seen more of an appetite. So one of the things we we actually hire out of law school. So we have a smaller program than most firms, but we will every year have anywhere from two to six summer associates, um, you know, with who, which hopefully uh, turn into full-time hires. But um, when I visit with law schools, when I talk to the recruiting organizations or the deans of admissions, they, they are already starting to broaden beyond the core curriculum that, you know, I went to law school with. And, and part of it is, talking about leadership and understanding what management and leadership looks like versus having that be something you just learn if you end up having a good mentor or not. Um, and the other is better understanding what it means to work in-house. When I was in law school, in-house, you know, I, I very naively thought of in-house as sort of what you do when you are ready to just you know, hire all of your friends to do all the work and you just sit and you know, manage the phone. Um, and, and I think clearly law school does not teach um, what it looks like to be in-house, but more and more schools are starting to think about that as exposing their students to that earlier rather than wait until they're in the profession themselves. So I, I don't know that they'll get all the way to coding, but I, I do see some evolution of how they think about what it means to be a lawyer, graduate from law school, and how prepared they need to be in order to be in a professional setting, whether it be a law firm or an in-house department. Well, that's great news and, um, and exciting to see how that transpires over the next five to 10 years. And uh, I think uh, everyone will benefit from that. So that's a great way to lead into the last little section here. And, and obviously this is what we call our Deloitte Resilient Podcast, Risha, yeah. as you know, and, and we love to talk about resilient leadership as we kind of close out and just really rapidly, we can actually kind of call this our lightning round. Sure. A few questions for you and, and your thoughts in just a few sentences. First of which, what do you believe to be the attributes of a resilient leader? Uh, resilient leader. Um, adaptability, accountability, and a growth mindset. I love it. And uh, do you think that answer would have been any different uh, pre-pandemic from what it might be today? You know, I don't know that the answer would be different, but I think I would have leveraged different examples of what maybe crisis mode might have looked like pre-pandemic. Totally agree. And, and speaking of that, from a crisis perspective, what are the qualities that you believe CLOs and, and other in-house attorneys just in general need or, or should put into place in recovering from crises, whether it be one we're dealing with now or just the day-to-day -day crises that we all experience along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think you need to have a, if ever there were a time for a calm sense of urgency, I think you need to have that because unlike other functional support within a company, most of the time people will fall back on what's, what's legally required or what are we compelled to do because we live in such a litigious, litigious world. And so you, you will oftentimes be asked to answer questions like, you know, in March when we were closing down most of our offices in the U.S., well, um, you know, when do you think we'll be allowed to open or what's, what are we going to allow people to do? Do they have to wear masks when they're in the office? Um, do we have temperature checks? And there's no way you're going to have the answer to those questions. So you really have to have that calm sense of urgency to say, all right, let's figure this out. I will lead you to the right answer. Um, and I will do so with the benefit of strong support from a lot of different functional expertise along the way, but I will make sure that I do this. So kind of leadership capabilities requiring that you have to be comfortable not knowing everything that's going to be asked of you. And last question, given where we are right now in the midst of the pandemic, what gives you hope or 
optimism for the future as we come out of this? You know, I think in perhaps the hardest year, one of the hardest years personally and professionally for so many, uh, we came together, we connected to support the business needs on an accelerated basis. We found ways to recognize and push one another to lead in innovative ways. And we gave back to our communities more this year than in any other year. And I think if you can do that against the backdrop of this kind of year, anything is possible. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we have developed sort of a muscle across not just the legal industry, but across, you know, the globe, if anything, that uh, has pushed each of us to be more resilient than we ever thought we might be. And so hopefully coming out of this, we'll, we'll leverage that muscle memory and be stronger for it. I can't think of a better way to end our conversation. Rishi, thanks so much for taking the time. It's been a thrill and an honor to be able to chat with you today. And uh, I know our listeners will feel the same way. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. Rishi, thank you for joining us today. Your perspectives on building empathy for stakeholders and driving transformation within the legal department was truly inspiring. I heard some great things about failing fast, having a growth mindset, and ultimately, in this current environment, having a calm sense of urgency. I really hope all of you enjoyed hearing this episode as much as I truly enjoyed interviewing Rishi. If you're curious about some of the topics discussed, such as legal transformation and how to elevate legal operations, I encourage you to visit our Chief Legal Officer Program site on Deloitte.com. You can also listen to the Resilient Podcast on Apple Podcast, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and even Spotify. So until next time, stay safe and remain resilient.